It's good to have you here at Valley Harvest today. It's nice to see a lot of new guests here. Hope you've been made to feel welcome. We started a series last week called "Love Is pa- uh, called Living in the Overflow of God's Love. And we actually had a Bible study this past week. And uh, in your bulletin, you'll actually note that there's actually some 
some notes from, this is actually from last week, Wednesday night's study. I know that if you weren't here and you felt like going through that, this is from last week, and I wanted to make a point to let you know that this coming Wednesday night, due to graduation celebrations happening this week, which we're excited for because we have a few here in our own congregation, we're not going to have this coming Wednesday night study dinner, so that will be postponed until the following week. So there will be no study this coming week, but uh, if you want, if you didn't get to go through that this past week, that's what that's in there for. Um, also, before I get started, I want us to, I want to ask our congregation to be in prayer for a number of our families have been dealing with a lot of difficulties lately and, and sickness and in death. And, um, I know, uh, I'm going to ask, I know a lot of you got an email announcement and just if, if you would continue to be in prayer for the Polk family, you know, Jimmy's mother went home to this, this this week, and so just continue to be in prayer for him. We also want to ask you to be in prayer for one of our missionaries who was here last week, Linda Salas, and she went home, um, or actually crossed the border this past week, and um, just continue to be in prayer for her as well. So last week we started in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and we looked at what Paul's definition of love is here. And if you would, stand with me at the reading of the Word of God. 1 Corinthians 13, I'm going to begin, I'm going to read verses 1 through 8. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I, give my, if I give away all I have, and if I deliver my body up to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Lord, this is impossible for us to fulfill this requirement of authentic, genuine love, particularly towards each other because we are so imperfect in so many ways. And God, we ask for your mercy and your grace to empower us and to help us to love the way that you've called us to. Thank you, Jesus, in your name I pray, amen. You may be seated. You notice in your bulletin also there are some sermon notes uh, available for you. And in that I actually put our definition of love for this whole series. And... um, Actually, I don't have my bullet. I must have taken it out. But I put a definition right at the top of love. And the way we're defining love here is that love is the overflow of joy in God that gladly meets the needs of others. And actually, you'll see that definition at the very bottom of your notes there. That's the overall definition. Last week, I talked to you that that love is, is, yes, it's a duty. It's an action. But it is also something that moves you to joy. This definition is very important because sometimes in the church we've made the mistake of saying, yes, love is a verb, and that's very true. And so, you know, I'm going to do all these actions for you, but I'm going to do it in a disinterested sort of way to where I express no joy. And my friends, that's not real love. The Bible commands you and I to feel something in our love. It commands us to rejoice. So love, yes, is something we do. And it must be active, but it is also something that, that we do feel. And so I've refined my definition from last week to talk about patience. And so my second definition, which we will see at the top of that sheet, is that patient love is the overflow of joy in God that patiently suffers long with the imperfections of others. So as we go week by week, I plan to refine this definition so you can see what real love is. And I imagine that as you see this, you're going to realize, I can't do that. You're going to realize, 
that's not me, then, I, then it's impossible. And guess what? You're right. It is impossible. You cannot do these things without the Holy Spirit of God living inside of you and empowering you. The word here used in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4, for, that says love is patient. It's the word makothumai. It's, and it's the quality of self-restraint when being provoked, not hastily retaliating. It's the opposite of anger. It doesn't surrender to circumstances and is the opposite of despondency, responding with rebounding hope. It is a will, willingness to take someone else's unpleasant character traits in stride and to exhibit enduring patience. It is the opposite of the warped perfectionist who maintains a tight grip of control because they think the things that they are involved in are important enough to merit their impatience and their lack of grace towards others. Control freaks have a real hard time being patient, don't they? So if you struggle with patience, realize you might be more of a control freak than you think. Well, as I've studied this aspect of love in Scripture, and the, the, not only the word patience and long-suffering, but as I've studied how it's applied, I've, I've had to conclude that love is patient because it overflows and its enjoyment of its patience in God, of, of, of the long-suffering of God. In other words, the patience and long-suffering that you and I are to experience as Christians it's going to come what, as a result of you and I enjoying the very long-suffering and patience of God in your life. My friends, do you realize today that God has been exceedingly patient with you and waiting for you to come to Him? And it's not until you realize that and you begin to take joy in the fact that God is so kind to you that you begin to realize that I must imitate this patience that God has. You see, because a sincere love for God will influence your heart to imitate His patience. A sincere love for God will, will influence your heart to imitate Him. So if you're not imitating Him, you must begin to question how, what role He plays in your heart. You see, because the Bible says that God is exceedingly patient. 2 Peter 3.9 says that the Lord is slow to fulfill his promise. As some, he's not slow, I'm sorry. He's not slow, as some count slowness, but he is patient towards you. Why? Because he does not wish that any should perish, but he's holding back his wrath in order that many may come to repentance. I'd say God's been pretty patient. He's been waiting for 2,000 years since he left. Sometimes I complain that he's too patient. I'm like, Lord, come back quickly. But God is exceedingly patient. And I've learned that keeping company with God will teach me to learn a live, to, to live a life of love. When I keep company with God, I begin to imitate God. Romans 15, verse 5 through 6 says, Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another, according to Christ Jesus. Notice how he describes God, the God of patience and comfort. And we're ready to receive that, are we not? But notice he's saying, may God grant you to be like-minded. Well, what did he tell us? How is God? He's patient and, he's, and, he's, and he comforts us. He's saying, may you be the same. Why? Verse 6, that you may be with one mind and one mouth, that you may glorify God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says something similar in Ephesians chapter 5. I've chose to use the message paraphrase here because I thought it was quite creative. Uh, Eugene Peterson says, watch what God does, and then you do it like children who learn proper behavior from their parents. That's modeling, right? Mostly what God does is love you. Keep company with him and you'll learn a life of love. Observe how Christ loved you. His love was not cautious but extravagant. He did not love in order to get something from us, but to give everything of himself to us. Love like that. My friends, when you keep company with God, you begin to imitate him. That's the key. That's the answer that you're looking for. Keep company with God, and you will begin to imitate him. 
You see, because a sincere love for God influences your heart to imitate his patience, but it also influences your heart to be grateful for his great patience towards you. See, the more I'm around God, the more I become grateful on how patient he is with me. Colossians chapter 1, verse 10 says, We pray that you will be strengthened with all might, according to his glory, his power, for all patience and long suffering with joy. Listen to verse 12. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers, to, give, to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. Notice that the more time you spend with God, it produces a thankful heart, my friends. Thanksgiving is absolutely essential to your happiness. In God, your happiness in life, the most miserable people are the most unthankful people, are they not? So a sincere love for God influences your heart to be grateful for his great patience towards you, but it also influences your heart towards an attitude of humility. When you were... When you are spending time with God, you can't help but adopt a humble disposition. Why? Because it puts yourself in perspective. It puts the littleness of, of yourself before God. Again, in Ephesians 4, 2, Paul says, I therefore, a prisoner of the, for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. What is this manner that's worthy? With, it's, it's, it's characterized by humility, by gentleness, and with patience. And what is patience? Bearing with one another in love. Guys, we've got to put up with each other. That, that sometimes that's all we're doing is just, I'm putting up with you because you're an obnoxious rascal and you are really getting underneath my skin. But love does that. And love will do it even with a sense of joy. Not joy that you're annoying me. There's no joy in being annoyed. But there is joy that God is working through me. And there is joy that God, that I myself have been very annoying to God. I mean, I think I've irritated Jesus quite a bit throughout my life. And yet he's endured me. And so a humble disposition... An attitude of humility helps us think of ourselves more properly in our relationships to others. That's the problem is we don't think properly about ourselves. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 through 5 says, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. You hear that? You hear that? Think of others as better than yourself. Who does that in their natural frame of mind? Well, I do. I have very low self-esteem, and um, I don't have a lot of confidence. I get that. But I guarantee you in your heart, you really believe you are really good, and you wish other people would recognize it. I mean, ultimately, you wish people would really see the good thing qualities there are about you, even though you're not good in this area. But God, when you spend time with God, there's this humility that comes about because you think about yourself correctly and the right frame of mind. You begin to look out not only for your own interest, but for the interests of others. And so Paul goes on in that passage, and I won't quote the whole thing, but the following verses in verses 5 through 8, and he says, let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus. And he goes to explain Jesus' example, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. He wasn't worried about his reputation. And he humbled himself and took on the appearance of a man and humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. You see, there's nobody as humble as God. And when you spend time with him, you start acting like him. Jonathan Edwards, that great preacher from 300 years ago, said, he that is little and unworthy in his own eyes will not think so much of the heinousness of injuries offered to him as he that has an exalted opinion of himself. When you think of yourself in proper perspective, you don't think so much about the, injury, the injuries that people do towards you are not quite as big. 
So a sincere love for God will influence your heart to have an attitude of humility, but it will also influence your heart to respect His sovereign hand and the injuries you have suffered. See, ultimately, I've got to realize that God plays a hand in my pain. He might not always be the one inflicting the pain, although he does chastise me. But you know what? He does let the devil out on a leash so far, doesn't he? He does allow others to kill my body and to burn me at the stake for professing his name. He does allow others to beat me and insult me with their words and to slander me. God does have a hand in these things, though it is, I believe, passive. Because God does not rejoice in evil, but evil exists, doesn't it? When you are struggling with being patient, realize that in my love for God, I must realize that God loves me enough and that he has some kind of sovereign role and some purpose he's working out through all of this. James hits this idea in the book of James, chapter 1, verse 3. I I hate it when people quote this verse to me, so if you want to hate me, that's fine. I'm going to quote the verse before. Leave that up there, Tyler. But the verse, verse, actually, no, that's the verse I want. Verse 3 says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Is that what you want to hear when 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 you're upset? Count it all joy, brother. It makes you want to turn and sock them in the head, doesn't it? Just being honest, sorry. I mean, I just, what's with this guy, James? Count it all joy when you fall into trial. Am I just going to skip around and say, you know, happy, happy, joy, joy? I I, I don't think that's what he means. I'm not saying that couldn't happen. But joy is more than just a smile on my face. It's not even a smile on my face. Joy is an attitude of knowing that God is sovereign. And he's working through these things. He explains in verse 4 and and, and verse 3 says, knowing what? Why can I be joyful? Because I know that the testing of my faith is producing patience. I'm tired of hearing people say, oh no, don't ever ask for patience. I was always told that and I never did. Till the day that I realized if that's what I need and I love God, then I, then I need to ask him for it. Because it has to do not with me, but with God and the work that he is doing in my life. So I, like a madman one day, just let go and said, yes, God, give me patience because clearly I need it. Grow this within me. And he says, let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing hear me now, God plays a role in all this, does he not, according to Scripture? So you see, then, that is the first point that I made, is that love is patient. Why? Because it's, it overflows in its enjoyment of receiving God's patience. Do you take joy in the patience of God here today? And if you're struggling with being patient, apparently you're not taking enough joy in it. You've not thought about it enough. So I find meditating upon God and his patience towards me is the key to becoming more patient, my friends. What does this patience look like, though? We've seen how it look, what it looks like with God towards us, and all we have is this phrase that love is patient in verse 4. He's characterizing love for us. But notice that love, while it is patient because it overflows in enjoyment of God's patience, Love is patient also as it suffers long with the imperfections of others. Because you and I are imperfect. We live in an imperfect world. And some of our imperfections are more noticeable than others, aren't they not? Isn't it true? The closer someone gets to you, the more you notice their imperfection. (laughs) If you don't know that, get married. (laughs) Right? Get married. Man, the longer you are with someone, you notice their imperfections, and that doesn't mean love's not there. But you know, I'm so tired of our, our, our shallow culture that says, I fell out of love with him and her, and therefore it's all done. I don't, you know what they're saying? Is I don't feel those romantic feelings that I felt when I was, you know, you know years ago. And I agree that those, you know, romance is great, and I believe there should be some joy, there ought to be joy in our marriage and in our relationships to each other. 
But quite frankly, the more you and I get to know each other, the more we're going to notice our imperfections. So if love is patient, it suffers long with them imperfections of others. What are some of those imperfections? Well, notice that it suffers long with the weaknesses of others. I want you to see that some of the things that you and I have become impatient with are not always just things that people can control. Correct? When you're kindly serving someone with a handicap, a lot of times they had nothing to do with that handicap, and it's easy to get impatient at times. As you begin to think about other commitments that you have made with your time. You know, love is patient in weakness, the weaknesses of others. And all of us have weaknesses that are ingrained into our very personalities. You see, that's why we need each other. Because where I am weak, another might be strong. And where I am strong, I might be, be, be where another is weak, I might be strong on their behalf. We've got to realize that a lot of these things are just a part of our personality. Some are scatterbrained and careless, aren't they? I know you all got some, some faces going through your minds right now. Some are just scatterbrained. I mean, they cannot keep their mind focused on one thing for more than 30 seconds. Some are slow and methodical. They're, they're the processors. They think, right? And, they, and they, they have a method to everything they do. Some are fast and impulsive. You know what, by the way, can I just make up, isn't it funny, isn't it just hilarious that when God puts a couple together where one is, you know, fast and impulsive and the other is just real slow and methodical? <laughs> it's almost like a joke, isn't it? You know, they're, one's just spontaneous and let's just go here. And there's, you, are, you are stepping outside of my comfort zone. We need to plan this out. I need to know exactly where we are going to stay. I need to know exactly how much it's going to cost. I need to see the schedule, please. <laughs> well, a lot of us would see that as weakness, wouldn't we? The spontaneous would see that as a weakness. You don't know how to live free. And the planner would say, you know, it's a weakness. You're going to get yourself in trouble. And the truth is, is that we all are different in many different ways. Some are forgetful. That's me. Over analytical. Believe it or not, some of it, you know, it can be sin, but it can also be a weakness or just lazy. Okay? And some are hyper, aren't they? Well, we're all different, and all of us have weaknesses. And all of us have weaknesses not only that are ingrained to our personality, but we have weaknesses that are part of due to experiences we have in our lives. Some of us have had some tough experiences growing up. You know, that child that was abused, guess what? They're going to have some weaknesses that are going to follow them into their adult life. Some of us have been neglected by our parents. Some of us are, some of us are the products of very flawed parenting. I know. I did youth here in Chattachilla for a little while. And I don't know if Bob would agree with me. I've talked to him. I know about this before. But I personally think the greatest problem with Chattachilla's youth is their parents. I, I'm being honest. And I'm not trying to be hurtful at all. But the truth is, is you know, and, and sometimes those parents are, you know, they're, they're just the products of generations of teaching that have been passed down to them. So we all struggle with weaknesses. We, we live in a world that sees the weak and unproductive as unimportant and not worthy of our time and energy, but the gospel calls us to a total, radically different perspective. The world would say, you are not worth my time. I cannot spend my time helping you. You are weak. But the gospel calls us to a radically different perspective. That your value is not based upon what you do, but your value is based upon who you are. And God has made his image inside of you. So you and I are commanded to be patient with people wherever they are in life. 1 Thessalonians 5.14 And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, Encourage the faint-hearted. Help the weak. Be patient with them all. Do you hear that? He's talking about, he says, admonish the idle. In other words, there's a place for admonishment and correction. 
But he also says, encourage the faint-hearted and help the weak. But notice that last line says, be patient with them all. That's throughout Scripture. So, it's love suffers long with the weaknesses of others, but I also want to, you know, that love suffers long with the sins of others. Love and its patience will suffer long with the sins of others. You see, you and I are commanded to forgive others their sins as God has forgiven us. See, a lot of things that you and I look at within people is not just weakness, it's just outright sin. People sin against us and offend us all the time, don't they? And God calls us to forgive them. Um, remember Matthew chapter 6 where Jesus gives the Lord's Prayer, it's verse 14, where actually you pick up on it. It's, it's called the Lord's Prayer. I think it should probably more rightly be called the Disciples' Prayer because he's, he's teaching the disciples how to pray. And he tells them to forgive others their sins as our Father forgives us. And he says, for if you do not forgive others their sins, neither will my Father in heaven forgive you. My friends, we are commanded to forgive others. But I've asked myself this question over and over again. How can we love after having been hurt so deeply? That's got to cross your mind right now, doesn't it? See, people hurt us in many ways, and not all offenses are the same. Some of you have endured some of the deepest hurts, and you're thinking, if that's what it takes to get to heaven, David, then I'm going to hell. And I get how you could think that because life can be very cruel. People can be cruel, can't they? I've wrestled with this question and I don't want to treat it tritely. I want you to know, first of all, forgiveness is not just a one-time event. Everyone forgives at one point and then starts harboring it again and has to go back and rework through it. God's grace is there. I know that we all have the strength to love. Why? I will say we all have the strength. Why? Because the truth is, is that God's Spirit's been put into you and I. We look at that last week. Do you remember Romans 5.5? 5, 5? Romans 5.5 5 actually says God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given us. So I know it's hard. And I know it's hard for you even imagine yourself forgiving and being patient. But the Bible does teach that you do. You're not doing it on your own. And I also know that we all have the strength to love because the truth is that God, remember that God will turn our pain into something good. Will he not? There's one verse I know many Christians like to quote. Romans 8, 28 says that God works all things together for the good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. That teaches me that God does somehow his sovereign hand, and we've seen that in James, that somehow he's using these, even these deepest hurts, that somehow he's using that to, for my good, and I don't get it, God. How can you use this abuse to work something good? I don't get it, and I guess there is faith that comes into that. There's trust in the promises of God. But love does suffer long with the sins of others, and last but not least... This patience, this patient love, it suffers long while waiting for justice. It suffers long while waiting for justice. I make this point because that sense of justice that you feel in your heart, that sense of wrong, it needs to be made right. I want you to know that's from God. God is a God of justice, and he promises that every, every offense ever made in this world will be made right. We might not always see him made right in this world, but God promises that that will happen. But in the meantime, the Bible is clear that vengeance belongs to God. Vengeance belongs to him. Romans chapter 12, verse 19 through 20 I chose a new living for this. It's kind of easy to understand. It says, do friends, dear friends, never take revenge. Leave, leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scripture says, I will take revenge. I will pay him back, says the Lord. The, the alternative, he says, instead, verse 20, 
Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals of shame on their heads. You see, extending forgiveness to those who have wronged us is not easy because it seems so unjust and fair. Bitterness is often caused by a belief that the person who has hurt us will somehow escape punishment. Right? Are they just gonna God gonna let them get away? What if they repent? God's just gonna forgive them? Well, there may still be consequences for their sinful actions. The Bible talks about that. There are consequences to everything, and there might need to be restitution that needs to be made. But if they've genuinely repented, there should be some kind of fruit. Some people, you know, make these professions and say their slates wiped clean and they go on acting the same. You know, uh, John the Baptist was really clear in Matthew chapter 3, verse 8, he says that they need to bear fruit. That it's, that is, makes it obvious that they repented. But mostly you need to realize that Christ's substitution on the cross more than completes the moral cycle of God's justice. I know we don't always get that. Quick note, our love for people and our patience with them should never minimize their sin. The church has been guilty of that. We should never minimize the seriousness of their sins. But waiting for God's justice usually requires that we confront sin directly. And my friends, I want you to know also, I've seen this happen before. People in the name of being loving Christians have not stood up for people who were being harmed. Just be patient with them and love them. I want you to know that in the face of immediate danger, the most loving action that we can take is to protect the helpless from harm. So God's not calling you to sit in this, in this dangerous situation over and over again. But nonetheless, He does empower us to do these things. My friends, this is challenging, isn't it? This is why we've entitled this series, Living in the Overflow of God's Love. Because the truth is, is that in your natural state, you wouldn't do that. You know, the Greeks, as a matter of fact, Aristotle made it very clear that to forgive someone and to be patient with someone was not a virtue, it was a vice. And the Romans picked up on that idea. To be patient and kind with someone was to be a sissy. It was to be a vice. It was, to, it was, it was abnormal. And I've realized that's really carried over, hasn't it, in our day? You know? I, for one, am a, you know, I love watching Rambo. I've said that probably too many times. And I think I like it because I like seeing justice come about. But I've got to say, in our world, it's so easy to just say, you know what, this isn't right. I'm going to take this action. I'm going to, I, yep, you know what, I am going to say this about this person because it's a truth. And the world needs to know it. When God is calling you and I to exercise a different way of living, The truth is that you and I can't do this without the help of God. This is weird stuff, isn't it? This is not of the world. Perhaps you can't do these things because you've never really encountered the living Christ. Not the one who died 2,000 years ago and still dead. I don't know him. I know one, though, that died 2,000 years ago, rose three days later, and is alive and present with me right here, right now. He is in this room. He is available to you and I. Perhaps if we can't do these things, perhaps it might be that you've never really surrendered your life to him. Or perhaps maybe you have and you've just got caught up in a sinful cycle And today's the day for you to repent of that. I don't know what it is. But I'm making the opportunity for you today to respond. Stand with me. Team, you can make your way down. While they make their way down, I'm going to share with you my imperfections. Truth is, is that this week I had a moment where I realized I was being very impatient in a conversation and um, 
I begin to I begin to realize right away, God, don't let this happen to me. I gotta preach on patience this week. I'm gonna feel like a total hypocrite. And I'm not gonna be able to preach on it. And I began to just immediately get nervous in my mind as the conversation went on and I try to keep my tongue quiet. I know my face started turning red. And I know that I began to uh, search for godly ways of being able to tell them how I really felt. I just had to have a moment where finally I just put my head in my hands and just said, Lord, this is my sinful nature. It's not of you. And I asked that you'd help me. And, it, and in that moment, I just all of a sudden remembered God's patience with me. And I remember that the people that I'm speaking with, just like me, are imperfect. They are sinners. And they don't get everything right. And I begin to realize that God's hand is in everything. And it began to comfort me. And you know what? It changed my perspective. My friends, God will do that with you. But you've got to make the choice here today. My dear Heavenly Father, we all stumble in many things. We ask that you would forgive us for our sins, that you would make us right with you. We ask that you would cleanse us of our unrighteousness. And God, we pray that you would help us to see other people the way that you do. Because so often we just see them as sinners. Yeah, rotten sinners that we want nothing to do with. Inconvenience. God, we cannot do these things without your help. We've all been guilty, Lord. Lord, every hand in this room is dirty. I just pray that you would forgive us and empower us to be forgiven by you and to be patient with those who, whom you use to grow us. Thank you, Jesus, that this is all made, forgiveness is available through what you've done for us on the cross, whether we feel it or not. Help people to respond to your truth, not just to feel it. In your name I pray, Master. Amen. I want to invite you to respond today as the team leads us in a song. What more appropriate than to ask God to clean our hands? Please turn up.
In Mark 12, 43, Jesus comes to the temple with the purpose of teaching us a lesson about giving. He deliberately sits in front of the offering and watches as people put their money in. Many rich people come and put in large amounts of money, but Jesus wasn't looking at the amount. He was looking at their hearts. Finally, after all the rich people had showed off their tithes, a poor widow comes in and puts in two small coins worth only a few pennies. But this is what Jesus had been waiting for, and he doesn't waste a moment. He quickly calls his disciples together to teach them about the kind of giving that pleases God. He explains how giving out of your abundance isn't what God is interested in, because it doesn't help you rely on him. This is what the rich people were doing, but the widow was different, and the difference was in what she was trusting in. The widow trusted God, knowing that he would stand true to his promise of providing for her needs, while the rich people trusted in their money. Jesus' point was that giving isn't about the amount, it's about the sacrifice. What and how we sacrifice will be different for each person, but we all have the ability to make sacrifices in our giving. The danger comes when we follow the path of the first group of givers. We give to look good, or we give out of a perceived obligation, or we give as a means to some other end. But God isn't interested in this kind of giving. The only giving that interests God is the kind that makes Him a priority above our money. This is why what we use our money for is such a big indicator of where our hearts are at. When we sacrifice something we want and give instead to God, we show that He has the top spot in our hearts. The poor widow trusted God and gave everything she had to Him. And this is why Jesus makes a point to highlight her sacrificial giving, because as we follow her example, she leads us right to Jesus. Father, we thank you this morning, Lord, and we thank you for the opportunity that you've given us, Lord, to learn and to grow in patience, Lord. Be patient with us, Lord, as we grow in your will, Lord. And we thank you this morning for the sacrifices that we're giving unto you, Lord, to further your kingdom and to reach the mission field of Chowchilla, Lord. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and uh, stand. Um, so this last song is going to be our, our closing, uh, closing prayer. And so uh, we're going to sing out our prayer, and it's going to be a prayer of amazing grace that our God has for us.
is the king who conquered the grave. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. Worthy is the king who conquered the grave. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. Worthy is the king who conquered the grave. Enjoy your weekends. You guys are... Happy graduation. Oh, yeah. Happy graduation to all those who are graduating next week, I think. Right. All right. So, yeah. You all are ready to get out of here.